So if all of you can join me and please give me a big Haas uh, welcome mm. to Dr. Abrams. So before I get started, I just wanted to engage the room a little bit. Um, how many people here are not MBA students? <laughs> oh, wow. So I, I public, um, public health, mostly public health, okay. And I wanted to ask how many students prior to their current studies have either worked in or formally studied biology, life sciences, or clinical sciences? Okay, okay, so we have, so we have about a, almost a third of the people have some sort of familiarity. So what I wanted to do was just, let's start off by getting everybody on the same page. So Dr. Abrams, can you perhaps just give us a high level overview of what the term cannabis means and for what conditions are we able to use it for? Oh, well that's a, so cannabis is a plant. Uh, it's been around probably for three to 5,000 years as far as we can tell from archeology. span uh, probably was developed in uh, China and then moved to the Indian subcontinent, then further west into the Arab world, came to the Western world in 1842, uh, where later it reportedly became Queen Victoria's favorite treatment for her menstrual cramps. At the beginning of the last century in the United States, most of what we recognize as the forerunners to big pharma uh, had cannabis medicines available for patients. So cannabis is a big weed, is all it is. That's, hence it's called weed sometimes. And uh, two different species are out there, uh, maybe three. But cannabis sativa and cannabis indica are the two most well-known species. Uh, the plant, the, the main psychoactive component of the plant is found in the resin exuded from the flowers of the female plants. And that psychoactive component is called delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. This is a 21 carbon compound, and in the plant there are at least 400 different chemicals, of which maybe 150 are related to THC, in that they're also so-called cannabinoids. And one that's become very popular lately that it's very difficult to avoid they even put it in Carl's Jr.'s Burgers in Denver on 420, is CBD, or cannabidiol, which is felt to be not psychoactive, but that is incorrect. It is psychoactive, but it's not intoxicating, like Delta 9 THC is. In, CBD has gotten catapulted to the top of the most favored cannabinoid list by uh, my friend and colleague Sanjay Gupta in his four-part series weed, weed two, weed three, and weed four, where he showed young children seizing on television, suddenly stopped seizing when they got a drop of this miraculous CBD oil from Colorado under their tongue. Uh, this, just because this is business school, has really catapulted uh, the brothers, whose name I'm forgetting, uh, to the top of industry in uh, CBD uh, production, and also led to GW Pharmaceuticals, now known as Greenwich Pharmaceuticals, to do clinical trials with a pharmaceutical preparation of cannabidiol that did in fact show that it's useful in children with these seizures. So it has now been uh, approved uh, for sale. Uh, Epidiolex is the name of it. So uh, cannabis uh, was available for physicians to prescribe to patients up until 1942, uh, Harry Anslinger, uh, a prohibitionist who became the first head of the Federal Narcotics Bureau, introduced in 1937 the so-called Marijuana Tax Act to sort of fool physicians because they knew the medicine as cannabis. So he used the Mexican name to associate uh, the medicine with more nefarious south of the border goings on. Harry Anslinger was reportedly a racist, and he felt that widespread use of cannabis by African-American jazz musicians and Mexican migrant laborers was going to lead to increased crime and mental illness in the United States. So he introduced this law which imposed a tax of a dollar an ounce for medical use and $100 an ounce for recreational use, which in 1937 dollars was a significant penalty. And Congress passed the act. So in 1942, cannabis was removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia. That's our 
national formulary, and physicians no longer were able to prescribe cannabis as a treatment for patients. In 1942, Fiorello LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York City at that time, before he became an airport, uh, called together a commission of people uh, to uh, adjudicate whether or not widespread use of cannabis was going to lead to increased crime and mental illness. And that report, the LaGuardia Commission report, uh, said no, it wasn't, and this should be available as a medicine. In or so years since that time, some other august uh, body uh, from the government has re-reviewed all the data, which is what we did at the end of 2016, and come up with the same conclusion that this is a useful medicine and should be available. Unfortunately, in 1970, the Controlled Substances Act placed cannabis in Schedule One, which means that it has a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. And it means that physicians cannot prescribe cannabis unless they have a special Schedule One license. And the only way you can get that license is if you're doing research on the plant and you can't really use that license to prescribe it to people. So uh, cannabis is a plant and it's, you know, it's nature. And if somebody once said that if somebody discovered cannabis in the Amazon jungle today, every pharmaceutical company would be rushing to try to develop it as a medicine. But it has this uh, international stigma attached to it. And part of that came from 1961, the United Nations had a, a single treaty. Uh, 195 nations all accepted the fact that cannabis is a dangerous narcotic. And it isn't a narcotic, and it's not dangerous. But this is the fight that that some of us have been up against for some time in trying to do research with, with the plant. Now, personally, uh, I went to college in the 60s. Uh, I went to Brown University, and then I went to Stanford. And I would be a very different person today if alcohol were my substance of choice for recreation on the weekends rather than cannabis. And, you know, when I put that on a slide, that my disclosure is that I went to college in the 60s, and I'm talking at a medical conference, everybody laughs. But I said, you know what? That's really one of my best credentials. Because I know what cannabis is, and I know what it isn't. And there's so much hysteria and reefer madness out there of people, you know, demonizing this this plant, which has uh, a lot of different potentials. So you asked what the indications for use of cannabis were. Well, since 1970, when it became a controlled substance, uh, a Schedule One, uh, the only legal source of cannabis to do research on is NIDA, which is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And NIDA has a congressional mandate that they can only study substances of abuse as substances of abuse. So if you want to study the potential therapeutic benefit of cannabis, you must use NIDA cannabis, but they cannot fund the study. So you have to get funding from elsewhere. We were lucky in the state of California at the end of the last century. We had a budget surplus. And one of our state senators, John Vasconcellos, appropriated $3 million a year for three years to establish a center for medicinal cannabis research at the University of California that was housed at University of California, San Diego. And with those monies, uh, they were able to fund clinical trials here in the UC system that looked at the potential health benefits of cannabis. However, most of the published literature that we reviewed uh, for the 2016 publication of the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids is looking at cannabinoids. That is, the pharmaceutical Delta 9 THC products that have been licensed and available since 1986 for treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. There are very few clinical trials in the medical literature that look at the plant. And in fact, most of them I did. So, uh, you know, it's now, I think, with all of the availability of cannabis products in dispensaries, people say, well, let's study gummy bears or let's study 
edibles or let's do oils. There are so many things to study, uh, but you're not allowed to because the only legal source of cannabis for research comes from NIDA. And NIDA spends $150 million a year funding investigators looking to see the harmful effects of cannabis. And those studies, unlike the ones where you're looking for the therapeutic effects, you're not randomizing this half of the room to smoke cannabis three times a day for the next 20 years and this half not to. You can't do that. So what, we, what those studies are are basically observational or epidemiologic studies where you ask people, did you use cannabis? And yeah, and then did you develop this? And that's it. And it's not the same precision of the research, but there's loads and loads of it out there in the medical literature because that's what the government supports. So when you ask what cannabis is useful for therapeutically, first of all, most of the information in the public literature is from dronabinol or nabilone, which is the capsules of Delta-9 THC. Uh, and those seem to be useful for uh, nausea and vomiting related to chemotherapy, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, and maybe pain, although for pain, because of the studies I've done, the plant has also been shown to be effective, more so than inhaling placebo. Uh, otherwise, those are the ones with the strongest evidence uh, in the medical literature. Uh, sleep is another uh, symptom that seems to be benefited, and that is mainly from studies of something called nabiximols, otherwise known as Sativex. That's a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD in a whole plant extract produced by the same people that have just gotten the go-ahead to market the Epidiolex, the CBD product for uh, uh, seizures. They've been trying to get the other drug, the one-to-one -one THC to CBD, approved in the United States for many years. It's licensed and available in Europe and Canada uh, starting out as a good treatment for spasticity related to multiple sclerosis. But any studies they've done in the U.S. so far have been negative. So our Food and Drug Administration has not yet approved Sativex, although they did approve the Epidiolex. And interestingly, uh, the Dronabinol and Nabilone drugs are Schedule three, which means anybody can prescribe them. They're not particularly regulated. And Epidiolex is Schedule Five, which means, you know, no risk of any harm. Uh, and that's the CBD drug. Let me just say that prior to the studies in children with seizures, there were only five clinical trials in the medical literature of CBD, which has totally gone crazy in people making claims about what it does and what it doesn't do. And the largest of those studies was 24 people with social anxiety disorder. 12 got CBD and 12 got placebo prior to a simulated public speaking engagement. And in that study, the people getting CBD had less anxiety. The other studies were in Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and dystonia. All of those are like neurodegenerative diseases. And the fifth study, showed that people getting CBD were able to cut down on their tobacco more than people getting placebo. But again, the largest of these studies was 24 people. So there is not a huge amount of data in the medical literature that CBD does anything, even though it's having extraordinary claims about being a panacea that's a miracle. So I, I wanted to follow up a little bit on that. Um, most There's business students and public health students, and many of us are interested in medical and commercial opportunities. Um, what, I'm sure all of you have by now in California seen billboards um, with cannabis um, companies and related opportunities. What I'm curious about as a researcher, what are the, if you can just maybe address some of the common claims that um, companies, entrepreneurs, et cetera, are making that either aren't backed up by research and or you think are dubious, a cancer being one of them. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, because as an oncologist, that's, for me, the most painful thing is that 
my patients, some of them spend $7,000 a month buying highly concentrated CBD or THC products and getting these very complex instructions on how to increase the dose over time uh, to the point where some of them are unable to get out of bed and don't eat, uh, and they think that they're curing their cancer. And for me, the most painful thing that I see as an oncologist are people that have waited six months to see me in my clinic because of my backlog, and they're treating a potentially curable cancer with CBD or THC, uh, hoping that I'm going to say that that's a good idea, and now they have metastatic disease and can't be cured. So uh, the, the suggestion that cannabis cures cancer really comes from my friend and colleague Manuel Guzman's laboratory in Madrid, Spain. Manuel's group studies uh, the effects of cannabinoids on metabolism, and the most metabolically active cells in the body are the brain cells. And the brain is where we have the highest concentration of the so-called cannabinoid 1 or CB1 receptor. Whenever I give a lecture and I tell physicians about this receptor in the brain being the most densely populated receptor in the human brain, the CB1 receptor, I say, how many of you learned about that in medical school? Never a hand raises. I mean, that shows the extent of cannabis prohibition that we don't teach doctors about the most densely populated uh, receptor in the human brain. But anyway, Manuel's group grows up rat brain in tissue culture and adds cannabinoids, laboratory chemical cannabinoids, uh, to the tissue culture. And they said, oh, maybe we could do this faster if we used a brain tumor. So they grew up a rat brain tumor, and they added the cannabinoids, and everything died. So they said, oh, we must have done something wrong. So they did it again, and everything died. So they said, well, maybe this is a bad batch of cannabinoids. So they went back to the normal rat brain, and they added it, and everything lived. So since that time, they've done a lot of elegant research explaining how in the test tube these chemicals work to kill rat brain tumors. But that doesn't translate into curing cancer in people. So, you know, you ask that question, and I don't really keep track of claims that people are making. Uh, you know, I think uh, what we're doing now is a study in San Francisco, San Diego, and Chicago where we're asking patients at our three integrative medicine clinics and at three dispensaries in each city to fill out a 15-minute online form about if they're using CBD-enriched products to find out what they're using, what they're using it for, how they're using it, and whether it works. And I just have some of the preliminary data on the first 500 people, and it looks like most people are using it for pain, anxiety, and sleep. And interestingly, there was a study from Kaiser in Colorado where they found that people using CBD said that it helped them with anxiety and sleep, which again is why I say CBD is psychoactive because anxiety and sleep are motivated through our psyche. So to say it's not psychoactive doesn't make sense. It doesn't get you stoned. I don't even like the word intoxicating for cannabis because it, the root word there is toxic. I think alcohol intoxicates. I mean, I've reached an age where I really can't even drink anymore because when I do, I really feel toxic. So I think, you know, cannabis is quite different. Uh, it doesn't give you that toxic feeling. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I think CBD claims to me are, are the most disturbing. Uh, this is, I think, a, I don't know numbers that well, but I would guess it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, I sent an email to Sanjay Gupta. I said, look what you've done. <laughs> you know, I mean, he started it. And he responded, he said, you know, I think you might be right. He said, you know, he said, but I think it may have some medicinal benefit, don't you? And I said, yeah, but I don't know. And it's not the only cannabinoid. There's something called tetrahydrocannabivirine, THCV which is another related compound that seems to decrease appetite for food, tobacco, and opiates. And if we're going to develop individual components of the plant as medicines, that would be one that I would look at as well. Personally, I, as in my integrative medicine work, uh, was very fond of traditional Chinese medicine 
in which they often use the whole plant and don't take one chemical out of the plant and put it in sesame oil, which is what we did with uh, THC to make uh, dronabinol and nabilone. So I think the plant provides what, what we've come to call the entourage effect, that it's not just the cannabinoids, it's also the terpenoids. Cannabis, if you've ever smelled it, each strain sort of has a different smell. And that's because of these terpenes, which are volatile compounds, and they themselves may have some medicinal benefit. So there's limine, which gives it a little uh, you know, citrus smell, pinene, which gives it that outdoor fresh smell, beta caryophyllin, which is something in black pepper, which gives it a peppery smell, and then all of these terpenes are now also felt to have some potential medicinal benefit. So if you just take a cannabinoid, CBD or, or THC or THCV, uh, you're not getting all the effect of the other 399 chemicals that are in the plant. But, you know, for business school, how do you patent a plant? I mean, it's nature. You know, what are you going to do? I, I do work with a number of companies as a scientific advisor that, you know, sell cannabis in Canada, in Maui, uh, Recently, I went on a visit to a, a grow facility in Dog Patch in San Francisco. I mean, it's just like, it's on, I live on 20, well, I can't tell you where it was, but <laughs> it's on my block, but 1.3 miles uh, away. And I said, wow, who knew? It was in a, a building where they used to make safes, and it's now completely cannabis, you know. I think CBD has catapulted to the top of the most favored cannabinoid list because of this concept of it not being psychoactive. So my husband, Clint Werner, wrote the book, Marijuana Gateway to Health, How Cannabis Protects Us from Cancer and Alzheimer's. And he's a bit of a aficionado. He judges for the High Time Cannabis Cup. And in his book, he made up a word and I always forget which word he made up because I made up a complimentary word. And he said, we live in a Puritan-derived Judeo-Christian society that thinks it's not good to be high. So he said, the reason that people are so into CBD is because of our euphoranoia or euphoraphobia. I forget which is his and which is my word. But, you know, I think there's something to be said about that. Um, I wanted to follow up on that. One condition that people often um, cite, and actually a, an official contraindication in the Canadian guidelines, is schizophrenia. Now, I know the National, the National Academy, you had addressed that, and the evidence isn't conclusive because it's hard to prove causation. S you know, many advocates will say we should, you know, for any patient that has schizophrenia or a family history, they should not be prescribed cannabis, and that's how we practice in Canada. I'm curious what your what your sort of thoughts are and what you anticipate, if possible, the evidence would be. Because it seems it seems as though, depending on who you ask, you'll get um, a different answer, and the evidence really isn't settled. So I'm curious if you can address specifically schizophrenia. So I think New Zealand has been the strongest uh, country to support the belief that cannabis use causes schizophrenia. Australia and New Zealand actually have some of the highest rates of cannabis use in the world, maybe because they're so remote down there in the middle of no place, but uh, <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, we concluded that there was uh, evidence that there was a statistical association between the use of cannabis and schizophrenia. But statistical association does not necessarily mean causation. So my theory is, <clears throat> I have a colleague, a physician at uh, San Francisco General whose brother is schizophrenic. And he says that cannabis is his best treatment for his thought disorder. And in fact, we concluded in the uh, government publication that cannabis does appear to help uh, schizophrenics with their thought disorder. So my feeling is that uh, people who are not yet diagnosed with schizophrenia as young people find when they first use cannabis, hey, wow, this really helps me with my... They don't know it's a thought disorder, but it is, and they use it. And then they get diagnosed with schizophrenia, and it's felt to be the cause.
So I think that that's what's going on with the schizophrenia thing. But there does seem to be good evidence that cannabis use helps thought processes in people diagnosed with schizophrenia. And there are now at least two studies of vaporized CBD in people with schizophrenia uh, to see how it helps their thought processes. One of them has been published in the medical literature. And <clears throat> according to the physician uh, monitors of the patients, it didn't do anything to improve them. But according to the patient reported outcomes, it did improve them. So I think the the bottom line on schizophrenia is still out. But, I, you know, if cannabis increased the risk of schizophrenia, then countries where cannabis use is very low would obviously have lower rates of schizophrenia than countries where cannabis use is very high. And decades where cannabis use is higher would have more schizophrenia diagnoses than when cannabis use is lower. Schizophrenia, 1% across the general population across the whole world doesn't change. I don't think cannabis causes schizophrenia. And interesting enough, even with lung cancer, I think I remember in a particular interview, you had mentioned that the Rastafarian population tends to consume higher amounts of cannabis on average, but they actually have lower rates of lung cancer, if I recall. So Donald, <clears throat> Donald Tashkin at UCLA is a colleague who's been funded for 40 years to study the harmful effects of cannabis smoking on the lungs. And he said if you're using that to keep it illegal, you don't have a leg to stand on. Because he's really found no detrimental effects of cannabis use. And in fact, in a large study, 1,500 people with upper aerodigestive malignancies in the Los Angeles basin, he found that people who use a little bit of cannabis actually had lower rates of lung cancer than people who smoked nothing. So cannabis is felt to be an antioxidant, uh, anti-inflammatory, and may have some anti-cancer activity. So <clears throat> does appear to increase or decrease perhaps the risk of lung cancer. In our report, we said that there was moderate evidence that there's no association between the use of cannabis and development of lung cancer and moderate evidence of no association between the use of cannabis and head and neck cancers, which cigarette smokers do get. The only evidence we found of an association <clears throat> was between use of cannabis and development of testicular cancer. And again, this is an association, but it's not necessarily causation. Because during the, the report that we did, we had a guy come from the National Driving Safety and Transportation Organization, I forget what it's called, but he told us that the question is always, does cannabis use increase the risk for traffic accidents? And he told us that in states where cannabis is available legally, there may be an increase in some traffic accidents. But he said, if you correct for, or if you adjust in the statistics for the fact that who gets into traffic accidents, young men, and who smokes cannabis, young men, then that increased risk goes away. Similarly, who gets testicular cancer, young men, and who smokes cannabis, young men. So that association may be statistical, but not necessarily implying that cannabis causes testicular cancer. It's similar to the fact that there are increased drowning deaths in months where ice cream is overconsumed, It's true, true, and unrelated. So I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit. Um, Dr. Abrams, you've been practicing since the 80s. So you've seen you know, America from the age of Reagan and say no drugs to a point now where I think over half the states have medicinal use. Um, many federal candidates running for president have advocated to deschedule it. I'm sort of curious, in the last 20, 30 years, what, what do you think has driven that change, both within the medical community and general American society? Because it seems to be a remarkable change. And I guess my follow-up question to that is, do you anticipate in the near future that cannabis will be descheduled? Because I talking to people in the Bay Area, there almost seems to be an underlying assumption that there's a momentum in that direction, but you know, there, there's always a possibility of regression. So I'm just curious 
um, what your perspective is on that. So I think the tipping point has been the maturation of the baby boomers. Because, you know, we were a very heavy cannabis-using generation. And as I said, we know what it is and we know what it isn't. And most of us have obtained uh, and attained positions of uh, authority, power, and respect. And we're not, you know, out there, you know, shooting up heroin or whatever people were afraid that people using cannabis were going to do. So uh, in 1969... I think uh, be when the generation of our parents were in charge, there was only like 11% of the United States was in favor of legalization of cannabis. And in 2014, it went to uh, over 50%, and it continues to increase. Uh, and I, I would say that as more of the states are making cannabis available uh, as medicine or recreationally, and people are seeing that there isn't, you know, Nobody's growing hair on their palms or whatever people were afraid of. And from your business perspective, it is big business. Uh, you know, that people are going to embrace it as a source of income and revenue for the states and uh, the country. Interesting, I heard that Eureka, or yeah, up there in um, wherever they are, that they were known as a big uh, cannabis producer in the past when it was black market is now sort of a ghost town because California has so many regulations now that it's recreational legal that those people that were independent producers have been driven out of their business and there are a lot of uh, poverty and homelessness now in places where uh, people used to be quite well to do and growing cannabis uh, you know for the black market so uh, you know, each administration has been slightly different. Uh, I would say Clint, again, my husband who wrote the book, thinks that for all of the grossness of our current administration that we've never had a president that has been so lenient on the cannabis industry. Uh, certainly after getting rid of Jeff Sessions, I think that made things a lot easier because he was a bit of a potential risk. And I don't know if we get a President Pence, how good he's going to be because he's a lot, you know, uh, more problematic, I think, than uh, my namesake, as it were. So uh, I think this is an interesting time. Sanjay Gupta came and spent two days with me uh, for a show. Uh, and I was on the cutting room floor completely. He just used one snippet of us walking down the hall together for so-called B-roll, which means it's just background, and I didn't even think our microphones were on, and he said, so? And I knew what he was asking me. I said, I used to say not in my lifetime, but now I don't know. I don't want to cut my life short. So, you know, I don't know, will it be descheduled, or will it just be legalized and made available. I was went to South Africa at, to be the expert witness for the Dacha couple. Dacha is how you say cannabis in South Africa. And this couple was trying to make cannabis legal as medicine for the people of South Africa. And I went for four days to the court in Pretoria waiting to be the first witness to take the witness stand, and the opposition blocked me for four days and I had to come home. So while I was there, I read the testimony of the expert witness for the other side. And this is a woman that I was, uh, NPR did a quickie, and they asked me before elections a number of years ago whether I would appear to tell why cannabis should be legalized. And yeah, I said, okay, I can do that. And then five minutes before the show started, they said, oh, we added another guest, Bertha Madras from Harvard. So I quickly looked her up and saw that she was an addiction medicine specialist. And I say that addiction medicine specialists and oncologists, sort of like the blind men and the elephant, we see totally different parts of the animal. So anyway, they must have done the same with her and told her she was going to be on the show. And then uh, five minutes before that, she said they told her that I was going to be the guest. But anyway, so we had to really uh, slug it out. Uh, event and in the middle of it, I got so enraged I called her dear, which was not nice. I appreciate it, but 
she didn't like that either. So, so in any event, I read her testimony in South Africa during the four days I was sitting there waiting to go on the witness stand, and she said, cannabis will never be a medicine because it's never gone through stage one, two, and three clinical trials. It can't be standardized. It'll never be standardized. Each plant is different. It's not a medicine. And it really made me think. Medicine, pharmaceuticalization of a plant, no. It's a botanical therapy, and it's been a botanical therapy for 5,000 years. And this attempt to pharmaceuticalize it might be the wrong thing. So not deschedule, decriminalize, and make it available recreationally. Again, I was just attending on the inpatient medicine service at San Francisco General Hospital for the last two weeks. The number of patients I admitted to the hospital and that I have admitted in my 40 years as a doctor with ravages of alcohol abuse is uncountable. I have never admitted a patient to the hospital with a cannabis-related problem. I wanted to ask, um, what inspired you to get into this? I imagine that what inspired you to... What inspired you to study and sort of pursue this um, as part of your medical career? Most oncologists, um, even most physicians that I work with, still have a very, you may say, draconian or old-fashioned attitude. You've been studying this for decades. I imagine it probably wasn't that easy you know, to get into it, to advocate for it 20 years ago, much less, you know, say, in the you know, 70s and 80s. So I'm sort of, what, what, what's your story? What really inspired you to want to pursue this? Again, as I repeat, I went to college in the 60s, and uh, it was fun, and I drove, by the way. I mean, you can't go to Brown University or Stanford and not drive. So um, anyway, uh, in 1980, no, 1886, I uh, began a relationship with a man who had AIDS, and uh, we became partners, and he used cannabis every day. And uh, the first AIDS drug came available in 1986, something called AZT. And I was not particularly fond of it, so I told him, don't take that. And he outlived three of his support groups at the hospital because they all took the drug and he didn't. And he did use a lot of cannabis, though. And I used to use cannabis with him, too, until it became clear to me that he was dying. And every time I would get high, I would get depressed and a little paranoid because I realized he was going to die and I was going to be alone. So, so that's sort of, you know, in my late 30s, uh, I think people in general lose their fascination with being high at a certain age. So I think that plus him almost, you know, well, he did die and, and that was that. But in 1992, uh, I was at the AIDS conference in Amsterdam, of all places, and Mary Rathbun uh, was on CNN News being arrested. Mary was a woman in her 60s uh, who was known as Brownie Mary. She was the volunteer of the year for two years in a row in our AIDS clinic at San Francisco General. She lost her only daughter to a drunk driver, but she was very pro-cannabis, anti-alcohol. And she would wheel our patients to x-ray and drop their prescriptions off in the pharmacy. And she would bring brownies for her kids. And they were those kind of brownies. And here I was in Amsterdam, glancing at CNN, watching Brownie Mary being arrested in Sonoma for baking brownies for AIDS patients. And when I got home, one of my colleagues, Mark Jacobson, who is an infectious disease expert, brought me a letter that was written by Rick Doblin who's the president of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Rick is a PhD from Harvard School of uh, uh, Public, what, no, Harvard School of, I forget which school he was with, but anyway, he fights the war on the war on drugs. And he wrote a letter to the director of research at the AIDS program, San Francisco General, which I was not, actually. But Mark brought me the letter. He said, you run this group of doctors in the community that are doing clinical trials maybe you'd like to do what this letter suggests. And Rick Doblin suggested that a study showing the benefits of medical cannabis should come from Brownie Mary's institution. 
as if she were our dean. And so I said, okay, I can do that. I picked up the gauntlet and I said, let me try to do a study of cannabis. So I sent Rick Doblin the template for how to write a protocol for our institutional review board, thinking because at the time he wasn't a PhD yet that it would keep him busy. But in one week, he sent me back a study proposal to look at three different strength brownies in patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome. And I said, well, you can't, we can't do brownies. Uh, they won't last for six weeks of a study. They're going to go stale. So let's figure out what else to do. And that was in 1992. And after five years of struggling, I finally was able to get my first grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse in 1997. Because the study morphed from one to see if it was of benefit in patients with AIDS wasting to see if it was safe. Because I learned by then, I, I met with Alan Leshner at NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. He was the head of it, the director. And I went to the Clinton second inauguration in January of 90s, whatever that year was, yeah. Uh, I went to the second, and I met with uh, Alan Leshner, and I said, you know, I don't want to keep pounding my head against the wall trying to get to do a study, because if I do a study showing that cannabis is not safe or ineffective, I think people are still going to use it. And if I do a study showing that it's safe and effective, I don't think it's going to change your scheduling. And he said, well, you could be surprised at that. And then he said, but you know what? We don't support studies looking at the potential benefits of cannabis because we are the National Institute on Drug Abuse, not for drug abuse. So... In 1996, we got our first effective anti-AIDS drugs, the protease inhibitors. And there was a report in the literature that somebody died from a reaction between the protease inhibitor and ecstasy, or MDMA. And that's because some of these protease inhibitors worked on enzymes in the liver that break down drugs, pharmaceuticals, as well as substances of, of pleasure, if you will. And so I said, I ran back to my pharmacology textbook, and I found that cannabis is also working on the same pathway in the liver. So I submitted a study to NIDA saying, I want to see if it's safe for patients with HIV on these new drugs to add cannabis to their regimen. And as long as I was looking for potential harm, they funded the study. So that was the beginning of my first study. And then, then when that study finished, the state of California had money to support studies that were actually looking at the potential benefit of cannabis. So I did a study in patients who had HIV and nerve damage in their hands and feet, peripheral neuropathy, and showed that cannabis was more effective than placebo. And then when I did that, I said, you know, my colleagues in oncology are not going to believe that smoking a cigarette is a 21st century drug delivery system. So we then studied with money from the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, the so-called volcano vaporizer as a smokeless delivery system. And we proved that this was a study we did in 25 to 40-year-old healthy cannabis smokers. And we put them in our clinical research center where we do all of our studies for six days and nights. And on each day, they smoked or vaporized half of three different strength NIDA cigarettes. And we gave them $600. So that was the easiest study I ever enrolled. We had to beat people away with a stick because everybody wanted to participate. And we showed that the volcano vaporizer delivered the same amount of THC to the bloodstream as smoking a half a cigarette. And we showed that people got equally as high and they had less expired carbon monoxide, which is a marker of exposure to noxious gases. So from then on, we only used the volcano vaporizer. And the next study we did was an important one because in animals, if you add cannabis, cannabinoids to opioids with relief of pain, one plus one equals five and not two. So we did a study in patients on sustained release morphine and sustained release uh, oxycodone, and we proved that it was safe to combine vaporized cannabis and that there appeared to be some increased relief of pain than with just the opiate alone. And then the last study I did was funded by 
the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. It was in patients with sickle cell disease where we used the one-to-one -one 5%, 5% CBD THC, uh, the first time using inhaled CBD in a clinical trial. The Food and Drug Administration has really been my best ally. They were very helpful until I submitted this proposal to study 5% THC and 5% CBD. And they told me that CBD was an NME, a novel molecular entity, and it has never been studied in humans. And they wanted me to submit to them two animal pulmonary histopathology studies. That is, what happens to a dog's lungs or a monkey's lungs inhaling CBD. And I said, you know, I don't do that. I'm a simple oncologist. I don't do animals. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to embarrass you. So I got these two investigators that were doing vaporized CBD for schizophrenia in London and Sydney to write me letters saying, there's no problem. The patients are doing fine. I showed them screenshots of dispensaries in San Francisco selling 10% CBD products. And I sent them a picture of a rolled and packaged cigarette that was 9% CBD. So they wrote back and said, OK, you can do your study, but send us two pulmonary histopathology studies or only enroll patients in your trial who have already inhaled CBD so you're not putting them at any greater risk than they've already put themselves. And add to the consent form that CBD could cause sterility in males. I mean, if it's an enemy, how do they know that? So I did what I was told, and I added it to the consent form, and we did the study. We said, "Did you have you inhaled CBD before?" Okay. Anyway, but I'll tell you, we don't have the results of that study yet. But CBD in a one-to-one -one ratio, I think, detracts from THC. It detracts from the high, and I think it detracts from the pain relief, because I feel like I saw greater pain relief in people smoking the 3.5% THC without CBD than I did in the 5%, 5%. But we're still waiting for that data to be analyzed. We don't have it officially yet. But, you know, CBD has gotten this, you know, this reputation. I, I went to dinner with a friend uh, last week. They had a big uh, mental health conference from the University of Arizona where I did my integrative medicine. They had at downtown at the Hilton, a thousand people coming from all over and I had dinner uh, downtown with one of my friends from Tucson and she came to dinner in a very fancy restaurant with a shopping bag and she took out a body lotion that contains CBD. She, she said, I forgot to bring body lotion. I found this and it has CBD in it. I said, okay, <laughs> congratulations. It's, uh, it's a huge business and there's no evidence that it really does anything as far as I know. So it's it's just five after seven. So that is going to wrap up sort of the formal discussion with me and Dr. Abrams. So can everyone join me in giving Dr. Abrams a round of applause? And at this at this point, um, we can take a few questions, um, medical or otherwise. Um, don't be scared. Uh, <laughs> um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I will uh, will hand you the mic. Press the button. Okay. Oh, yeah. You can just press, actually you can just press the button right for the public. Call. Yep. Just press that button. It should go green. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Abrams. So recently, I was in Sacramento at the Cannabis Control Summit, which was a convening of all the government agencies, law enforcement officers, etc., who are in charge of regulating cannabis. Um, so one of the speakers was UCSF Associate Professor of Medicine Suzanne Schick. Who's Suzanne Schick, and she's with the Center for Tobacco Control Research and Education. And in front of a room full of law enforcement officers, she was staunchly saying that cannabis smoke is just as dangerous as cigarette smoke. And um, you know, having read some of your research and heard you speak many times, she was just going really hard trying to convince these people that in a consumption lounge setting that people were exposing themselves to toxic smoke. And um, so obviously you haven't heard of her research. Um, and I, I spoke to her after and asked who is funding your research. And uh, I didn't write it down, but I think that it was some sort of 
tobacco-based yeah, funding. The, uh, lands, I believe, from our tobacco, you know, he's, has millions of dollars from the tobacco industry, and he's concerned that uh, big tobacco is going to take over big cannabis, and his group is the ones that are very big on the toxic effect of secondhand uh, cannabis smoke in animals that it causes uh, constriction of coronary vessels or something, and when mice get next to it, I, you know, again, I think animals are not people, and if you look at the epidemiology of, you know, of the world, people exposed to cannabis smoke, I, you know, I can't, I'm a simple oncologist, as I said, and I don't do those sort of experiments that she was uh, talking to the law enforcement officers about, but I don't see it uh, in the clinical world as being an issue. And it seems like past studies have proven that it's not toxic because it's not leading to lung cancer or any sort of other respiratory right. illnesses. Donald Tashkin says, I mean, our conclusion in the uh, National Academies of Science report was that it does increase the risk of cough and sputum. Cannabis and tobacco together decreases the risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease compared to tobacco alone. And as you said, a number of studies have suggested that cannabis actually may decrease the risk, not increase the risk of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what toxicities she was espousing of the secondhand smoke. It's constriction of blood vessels. You know, maybe it happens, but whether it's clinically significant or relevant, you know, is unclear. Yeah, and I thought it was just really harmful for her to be trying to convince law enforcement officials that it was that dangerous. Well, I mean, this is one of the problems that law enforcement and judicial have control over this issue as opposed to medicine. Yeah. I mean, it's a medicine. It's, well, it's not, for the birth of Madras discussion, it's not really a medicine medicine, but it's a botanical remedy. And it, it should be, you know, personally, I think cannabis should be treated like echinacea and mm -hmm. saw palmetto, but regulated like tobacco and alcohol. So would you consider it an adaptogen? Would you consider cannabis an adaptogen? I consider cannabis an adaptogen. So, you know, I'm funny on adaptogens. Adaptogens are herbs or substances that if you need your immune system boosted, it'll boost it. And if it needs to be downtrended, it'll downtrend it. And I, I just think that's giving a lot of uh, responsibility to the botanical. So, uh, you know, some some adaptogens seem to, to work. I don't know if I would necessarily call cannabis an adaptogen. I think it's a different class of agent, in my opinion. Thank you. From what I know of adaptogens. Yeah, I, I, maybe I should put my hearing aid in. I know there was, um, I know our time is limited, so there was a question over here. Um, so we'll do here and then and then you. Um, sorry, there's a mic there, so we should be able to hear you. Uh, oh, thank you. Great. OK, I have two questions, but I'll, I'll try to be quick with both of them. Um, the first one is, uh, do you know how the like how the California Study Center came about? Because it seems like in like I don't know if this was before or after it was um, cannabis was medicinally legal, but it seems like something that I'd imagine certain universities would be afraid of doing to in fear of like oh what's the repercussions from like federal funding or becoming like the weed school or something like that. So I'm curious how that came about. Sorry. Do I know about how the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research came about? Yes. Yes, I do, but I don't know if I can say it out loud. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, Senator John Vasconcellos was uh, a very uh, beloved state senator, and he was friends of some uh, folks uh, who were, were at the University of California, San Diego, and uh, they might have convinced him that that would be a good use of the budget surplus. And so uh, I sort of felt at the time that it would make sense to give uh, that $3 million a year for three years uh, to the office of the president of UC to distribute it for people that wanted to do research. But I was a little naive and didn't understand how it works and that they really needed some infrastructure for, to support some people at that other campus, so mm. they got the funds to be the virtual home of the center. But you're right that uh, even to this day, 
or to the day when I still had to write recommendations for patients to use cannabis, the University of California, because they are so well funded by the federal government, uh, was very fearful mm -hmm. of doing something that might uh, antagonize the government. And when the law came into effect in 1996, I remember state city attorneys coming from San Francisco to tell us that they would support us and back us if anybody tried to get funding, whereas UC attorneys came and said, no, nope, it's out of our hands. You do it at your own risk. And many of my colleagues at UC refused to write letters for patients to access cannabis in dispensaries because they said, we, I have federal grants. Mm -hmm. I said, I have federal grants to study cannabis, so that's not right. So yeah, so there is, you know, it's, there, there's still fear uh, because the federal government has not yet changed their policy or their stance that this is a Schedule One substance. Right. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And um, the uh, second question I have is, what do you think is the uh, potential of like real world physiological data playing into some of these cannabis studies, especially if it's if it might be more difficult to measure some of that physiological data in like a more lab setting? Yeah, so I am going to give a lecture at our International Associative of Cannabinoid Medicine conference in Berlin on Halloween, and my title is, uh, What Do We Know from the Real World mm -hmm. on Cannabis as a Therapy? And I'm going to use some of those, you know, people do crowdsourcing now and mm -hmm. all these things that I don't, I don't tweet and I don't, don't do Facebook, so I'm an old school. But, you know, people are collecting data like that now, mm -hmm. and, you know, in the absence of our ability to study 140,000 different preparations of cannabis uh, you know, therapeutic products, I think these observational studies are important. However, what I learned on the National Academies Committee is that anything observational automatically starts out two or three rungs below a randomized placebo-controlled mm -hmm. clinical trial with regards to the strength of the evidence. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Adams. Uh, Emirates, uh, I have a question about um, cannabis in relation to a condition called ADHD, attention deficit disorder. In relation to which? Uh, ADHD. ADHD. Yes. So, do you do you have a view on that? How? So I'm whether an oncologist, it, and I'm mm -hmm. an adult oncologist, but mm -hmm. I work with pediatricians who mm -hmm. find cannabis not only useful for ADHD but for autism, mm -hmm. and I've heard really amazing stories. In fact, I teach a course to first year medical and pharma pharmacology students. Uh, and I had the father of an autistic teenager come tell us his experience of how his son, who was violent and frightening and uh, you know, a poor student, totally turned around when he started using cannabis. And I think that uh, my colleagues also find that for some spectrum disorder ADHD people, it also has some benefit, but it's not anything that I personally, I don't do that. I'm a cancer doc. We have Thank time you. for one more question, so I know you had your hand up earlier. Thank you. Um, can you, you talked a little bit about schizophrenia being a potential contraindication to cannabis use. Are there other medical conditions or, or um, uh, pharmaceutical interactions that would be contraindications because what I'm seeing, I, I do, I'm part of a women's cannabis network and we see a lot of older women coming yeah. to us and they're on all kinds of Yeah, so you bring up a good point that uh, uh, Sheila Murphy is somebody who studies cannabis in the geriatric population from a qualitative research point of view and uh, you know, I have concerns about people with heart issues because cannabis causes increased heart rate and it can cause increased or decreased blood pressure. And if any of you have ever used cannabis, you know sometimes if you stand up too fast, you might get a little lightheaded. And older people, if they do that and fall down, at risk for breaking a hip would be not a good thing. So old people with cardiac disease uh, uh, are people that 
as far as drug drug interactions we really haven't found any that are clinically significant but i will tell you that c b d is a potent inhibitor of these enzymes in the liver and my patients taking highly concentrated c b d products i'm fearful that it may lead to increased toxicity of pharmaceuticals so especially the highly concentrated c b d oils and tinctures i have concerns about so if everyone we can give them a round of applause thank you very much